started on the panel this evening, uh, from my left to right, uh, on the proposition we have John Allen, a chaplain at the Exeter School, who also works at Belmont Chapel uh, here in town, and Dr Michael Green, a clergyman from the Church of England, theologian and author, and on my right, in the opposition, we have Keith Denby, chairman of the Devon Humanists, and Professor John Dupree in the philosophy department here at the university, um, and director of the ESRC Centre for Genomics in Society, also based here at the university. Um, I'll bore you all now with details and the rules. Every speaker gets five minutes of uninterrupted time, um, and there'll be no points of information from either the audience or uh, other panellists. Well, then, there'll then be a question and answer section from you, and unfortunately, as much as I try hard, this is not for me, but the best question of the evening. There will then be a brief summation of no more than two minutes from both sides. We'll have two votes this evening, one at the end of the debate, which will be based on the merits of the arguments you've heard, and one we'll hold momentarily, which will be based on conscience. <coughs> um, in the first vote, you may abstain, in the second, you may not. And if you've been to DevSoc before, you know we count the votes by me counting your raised hands. So please bear with me this evening. Uh, we'll take our first vote now. The motion is as behind me. This House believes in, uh, this house believes in the existence of God. Um, though you can propose with, vote with the proposition, with the opposition, or abstain. So without further ado, those voting with the proposition, please. Nice and high, don't mind. <coughs> Especially if you're on the floor. And all those abstaining, please. Further ado, please, I'd like to invite the first speaker for the proposition, please, Dr. Michael Green. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's not cool to believe in God at university. So why don't I go over and join the opposition side over here? Uh, it's fashionable uh, to be an atheist. It makes no moral demands on me. Yeah, I think I'll get rid of God. But what am I letting myself in for? An unbeliever has to live by faith just as a believer has to. I've got some problems to face. First is the problem of the world. We've thrown out the old-fashioned idea of a creator, remember, so we'll have to do without one. 
The world must have arisen by chance. Even more amazing is the, uh, the emergence of life. That must be by chance too. So impersonal matter, given lots of time and chance, produced personal life, did it? Hmm, that's a bit hard to swallow. But without a creator, the world is a fluke, and the biggest of all flukes on it is man. I don't much like that conclusion. It doesn't give a very flattering account of my intellect. And it certainly doesn't explain why, in a chance universe, the principle of cause and effect is everywhere apparent. Why should a random world be shot through with the consistent laws of nature? Ah, well, can't win them all. The problem of design. At least it looks like design. This world seems remarkably fine-tuned to support life, and human life in particular. Many scientists are recognizing this so-called anthropic principle. Had the constituents of our world been marginally different, there could have been no life on this planet. Um, but I've thrown out the idea of a designer, so I shall have to find another explanation for the radar of a bat, the focusing equipment of an eye, the incredible complexity of an ear, the hibernation of a polar bear for six months under snow, the migration of a bird over thousands of miles. Well, I suppose it's all the product of chance and evolution, but it seems a bit lame. Then there's a the problem of values. When I believed in God, I had some explanation for the values that we prize. Beauty, goodness, truth, love, and reason all sprang from God and were mute witnesses to his character. But now I've got problems. Truth is all relative. Beauty is just one manifestation of primal chaos. Goodness is impossible to define. There is no standard. Love is mere chemical attraction. And my reason that makes these judgments has no independent vital validity. It is just a complex mess of neurological pulp emerging from the mindless <coughs> matter of the universe. And then there's the problem of me. I'm an atheist, remember, and I must be rigorous in drawing atheistic conclusions. H.J. Blackman, who was once president of the Humanist Association, wrote, On humanist uh, assumptions, life leads nowhere, and every pretense to the contrary is a cruel deceit. Jean-Paul Sartre, the existentialist thinker, said, Man is an empty bubble on the sea of nothingness. A Nobel laureate Jacques Monod concludes, our number just came up in the Monte Carlo game. So where does this atheistic faith lead to? First, it leads to emptiness of purpose. You've got a meaningless universe in which our lives can have no long-term purpose or meaning. The atheist philosopher Nietzsche agonized over this. Everything lacks meaning, he says. The goal is lacking. There is no answer to our why. Secondly, you've got the collapse of ethics. You can't get morals from matter. There are no absolutes. There is nothing except my preference to differentiate the behavior of Jimmy Savile and Mother Teresa. If there no God, then everything is permitted, so Dostoevsky. And there's the onset of despair. Man now realizes that he's an accident, a completely futile being that has to play out the game without reason, so the painter Bacon to man as man, we can say good riddance, so the ethicist Skinner. Man is a disease on the skin of the earth, so the philosopher Nietzsche. But the trouble <coughs> is he can't live that way. Jean-Paul Sartre, who consistently maintained that God is dead, and man is a crumpled piece of paper in the rain, whose only liberation is death, said this before the end of his life. I don't see myself as so much dust that has appeared in the world, but as a being that was expected, called forth. In short, a being that could, it seems, come only from a creator. And this recognition of a creative hand drives me back to God. Well, who would have guessed it? Sartre could have proposed tonight's meeting. Now, moving over to the opposition, please, Keith Denby. Good evening, everybody. 
Um, the Exeter Debating Society is a, a serious and august body, uh, so perhaps we might uh, be taken seriously by the Lord Creator and have some kind of a demonstration of his or her presence. Um, could we perhaps have a bit of glowing mist? Uh, that would be quite convincing. How about a thunderbolt? That would be really convincing, uh, but not too big a one. No, nothing. Um, some people say that there is a body called the flying spaghetti monster that has been capable of creating all of us and all of our existence. It exists invisibly somewhere out there, <laughs> suffused with uh, heavenly tomato sauce. Some claim there are meatballs. <laughs> Perhaps we could ask this flying spaghetti monster for some demonstration of its presence. Can we, can we bear witness to its noodly appendages? No. Now which of those two is the more absurd as a proposition? Because neither have any evidence. And it is evidence that we are looking for if we are to approach this problem properly. No standalone proper evidence for the existence of any deity has ever been provided by any body. Good explanations of our existence, of our <coughs> very, very clever things like eyes, ears, and, and our ability to stand upright, come from looking at real evidence, real evidence that can be reproduced and can be used to make prediction. That is the scientific explanation. That has brought the benefits. The belief in a God creator for whom there is no evidence has in fact brought no benefits. Despite the claims that uh, without that guidance, uh, life is pointless. That's not how many, many people feel. They get their reasons for living uh, from the land itself, from the world itself. The lack of evidence is, is completely uh, impossible to deal with. You can't actually have the discussion. You can only start to look at circumstantial effects. And uh, one of the most important circumstantial effects you look at is the nature of evil. Bad stuff happens. There are tsunamis, uh, there are mur murders, uh, there are wars, and you ask the question, well, if there is a uh, all-powerful deity, then why is there evil? Is that deity willing to prevent the evil, but not able to? Well, then it's not omnipotent. If that being uh, is able, but not willing, then it's malevolent. If it's both able and willing, why is there evil? And if it's neither able nor willing, then why would you call it God? That's a bit of circumstantial. To take directly the point that was made about you can't get something from nothing, well, that's because you don't understand the science if you take that line. Um, some of you will be aware of the work of Lawrence Krauss, uh, recently published, <coughs> Um, looking at the innate instability of nothing. From nothing comes stuff all the time. It's a standard way that nothing behaves. Check the physics, quantum gravity effects. One last little bit of scientific effort is this comment about morality. If morality descends from, from uh, the creator, then we have been fleeing from that creator for the last 200 years. Mm -hmm. So surely our society would have become worse, our society would have become more damaging, more dangerous. It hasn't. We don't persecute people because of their sexual orientation, unless you're a member of the church. Uh, we don't <laughs> persecute people for... Uh, we don't have judicial murder anymore. Uh, we have much more care for the disadvantaged. The benefits of our modern society do not come from any belief in a creator. Now these are circumstances 
None of this is proof because there isn't any proof. I will end by saying science flies you into space, religion flies you into buildings. Uh, and moving to the second speaker for the proposition, please, um, John Allen. Mr Chair, sir, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Green has already suggested four major problems you have to overcome if you want to be an unbeliever. Now we'll return to this territory, there's much more that could be said. I'd love to answer Keith as well, but I think we'll leave that for the question time. What I'd like to do is list three more inconvenient additional facts that prevent me from dispensing with God as the people on the other side of the motion would like us all to do. First, there's the stubborn fact that religion just will not go away. If it really is an irrational, cruel, divisive, groundless, homophobic, divisive <coughs> fairy tale, it's doing pretty well in the world today. Indeed, instead of shriveling away, there's more of it around than ever before. And not just in the extreme forms you read about in newspaper headlines either. There isn't a culture in the world without a religion. And just look what's happened in <coughs> Russia, in China, in Cambodia, in Albania, in places where the restraints of an artificial imposed atheism have been taken away. Churches all over the place, religious intellectuals writing books, faith back in the marketplace. And even in the West, we're seeing the return of culture book despisers to faith once more. Anthony Flew, just a senile old man. Ian Wilson, just somebody who loves taking extreme positions for effect. <coughs> so, what about Irish novelist and playwright John Waters and his acclaimed book, uh, Lapsed Agnostic? What about Francis Collins, head of the Human Genome Project? And clearly nobody's fool. Is it just possible <coughs> that some of these people might have thought a little bit more deeply about things than Ricky Gervais or Jimmy Carr? In 1969, Sir Alistair Hardy's Religious Experience Research Unit started trying to analyse just exactly what religious experience was and how widespread it was amongst humankind. Forty years on, the conclusion of the present director, David Hay, is that religious experience, quote, is biologically natural to humankind. It's hardwired in. So either it's the most persistent delusion we've ever encountered, or maybe there's something in it after all. Maybe, in fact, we're denying the deepest truth <coughs> of our nature when we try to shut God out. But which God? Well, there's one faith which has had an impact on the world unlike any other in history. And the fact of Jesus Christ is the second inconvenient reality that prevents me from dismissing God. If Jesus were not who he claimed, I can't make sense of the impact he had in the ancient world. Dying in obscurity with only 120 followers who all ran away when he was arrested. And then conquering the Roman Empire with his ideas within 300 years. I can't make sense of the impact he continues to have all over the world today. I visited Israel a few months ago with a school <coughs> trip, and I was absolutely overwhelmed with the tour buses, the queues, the crowds of people, tens of thousands of folks swarming uh, to catch a glimpse of the place where somebody might have multiplied fish and loaves 2,000 years ago. Uh, it still fascinates the world. There are six million books in print about his ideas. But uh, Jesus inspires more than tourists. It's calculated that 85% of the world's hospitals in the world owe their origin to the faith that he started. Education, social care, world development, the list goes on. When Bob Geldof wanted to spend the money from Live Aid, he found to his fury and astonishment that he was giving it away to Christians all over the place because they were the people on the ground who were doing the job, caring and making a difference. And 19 million more adults decide to join the <coughs> Christian church every year, which is a rate of growth faster than ever before in history. If Jesus were not who he claimed, I can't make sense of the uniqueness of his thinking. No Jew in 700 years spoke with the same force and originality. Where did it all come from? I can't make sense of his career. He obviously wasn't mad, and he clearly wasn't a power seeker. What was he about? And I can't make any sense at all of what happened to the body after his death. That puzzle in itself has been enough to impel many intelligent people towards the possibility that his claims were actually true. Let me give you just one more inconvenient fact. Christianity changes people in ways I can't explain unless a living God is involved. It's not a superficial change, and it happens to people from many different backgrounds and all sorts of cultures. Something real happens when God's invited back into someone's life. Take Yusef Nadarkhani, the Iranian pastor who's been on death row for three years until just before Christmas international pressure forced the authorities to let him go. Where does that stubborn heroism come from? On three successive days, you're taken into court and told that unless you recant your faith, you'll be executed immediately. On three successive days, you say, I can't. I'm sorry. It's impossible. 
That puts you in a long line stretching back to people like Polycarp in the second century, offered the chance to recant his faith and survive by a sympathetic magistrate. Eighty and six years have I been his servant and he has done me none harm. How can I de deny my king who died for me? Puts you alongside people like Shabazz Bhatti, the courageous Pakistani minister gunned down in 2011 for persistently supporting the rights of minorities. He knew he was on a collision course with his enemies, but he left behind a video which you can now see on YouTube in which he says bluntly, I believe in Jesus Christ who gave his life for us, and so I am ready to die for a cause. Religion won't vanish away. Jesus Christ can't be explained away. <coughs> Changed lives can't be wished away. Let's be realistic. Vote for the motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. And now, finally, the second opposition speaker, Professor John Dupre, please. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, um, let me start by, by saying I think the world is a wonderful, remarkable place, and I can't explain everything in it. Uh, and there is there's a solution I could have to this problem. I could just think of an explainer a universal explainer who would explain how we came to be here, why there's a world here, why we have conceptions of good and evil. Uh, all the things I would like to understand about the world, I could have one um, universal explainer who would solve all my problems and I could get on leading my life and wouldn't have to worry about anything at all. Uh, I, I, I'm a philosopher and uh, I would be out of work. So that's one reason, I suppose, I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the reality is okay, that not many, a few hundred years ago, we really couldn't explain anything much. In the last few hundred years, we have made extraordinary progress. We have started to understand how the world works, why there are organisms like us and other kinds of animals and plants and particular love of mind microbes, how these things do what they do. We've understood that by looking and and doing experiments, seeing how the world works, playing with the world in all kinds of ways, and we've begun to understand it. Now, I'm actually a philosopher of science, and we're, one, of, one of the major questions that we're interested in in the philosophy of science is when we should believe in things that we can't observe. And this is um, something that is very important to understanding how we've come to explain the world. So we, we've come to believe in things like um, electrons. We believe there were once dinosaurs. Why do we believe these? We believe these because they explain things we observe. We can make machines because we know how electrons work. We can, as a famous philosopher said, we can spray electrons on something and they will behave differently. They will attract other things uh, and so on. So there are two parts of this. One is we look at some kind of thing we're interested in, whether it be life, whether it be how physical things work, and we play around with them, we come up with ideas about how they work, and then we may speculate about things that we can't see that we explain them. So one reason we believe in things is they explain what we see in the world and what we can do with the world. And now God can get to sort of that stage, right, because God explains everything. Right? God made the world as it is, however the world is, God made it. He even made himself, I guess, though that's a curious question which I'm not Good. a theologian enough to answer. But, um, but there's far more to that. When we're, trying to, when we're trying to explain things, we usually can come up with many different ways of explaining them, many different things we could postulate <laughs> that would explain them. So, you know, people used to think that we should explain life with you know, invisible forces, with life forces, with strange, with spirits or souls, and so on. We have a different explanation in terms of very complex processes involving material things that we're beginning to understand now. Now, why do we choose to believe one rather than another, one set of explanations, one set of partially unobservable things? The reason is that we start to make, we can actually work with these ideas. We can predict new things. So for example, um, 
if I think that um, the reason there are all these animals and, and plants around is because of evolution, a theory I've quite studied quite carefully, I want to make predictions. So for example, I'll predict where I might find a certain kind of fossil, I'll send people out, they'll dig it up, and actually, often they'll find exactly the fossil they were looking for that should have been there on a story about evolution. I might make predictions about, you know, the, 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 the God theory. For example, I predict that organisms would be nice to one another because God is supposed to be all good. I'd probably be a little surprised when I found, as Darwin pointed out, the ichneumon fly, which lays its egg inside a caterpillar, sticks a caterpillar down its hole and waits for its young to crawl out, start eating the caterpillar from the inside, <coughs> careful not to eat the vital organs so the meat stays fresh for a few weeks. Now, if that's the sort of thing a perfect, all powerful, all benevolent God is going to invent, that seems a curious prediction to make from the theory. And in fact, the truth is, there are no predictions to make because you can make any prediction. The only thing that I think you would expect is that the world would be a lot nicer if it had been made by an all powerful or benevolent God. Um, I'd like to thank the panel very much. Now, before we move over to the questions and answers, um, George, where are you? He's up there. He's oh. going to be running around with the microphone. Running from exaggeration. It's his weekly exercise, sort of thing. And, um, but because it's people on the floor, I think he's going to pass it down the aisle. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Try and keep it as short as possible, um, so we can get as many in this evening. Uh, Finley. Um, it was, I heard it was mentioned that there is possibly a biological f basis for faith. Surely that is not, this is to the op proposition, by the way. Surely a biological basis for faith is an exact argument against God. If it can be shown that we believe in God purely because it is our biological imperative to do so, that is not an argument that is true. It's an argument that at some point in our history it has been beneficial to believe in things that are not necessarily there, to give us some form of meaning. So. Sure, yeah, surely, a biological basis for faith is an argument against God, not for it. I think I was the one who made that comment. I, I, I don't think it's necessarily an argument against uh, the existence of God or, 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 or against a, our, our ability to, 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 uh, to look in that direction. You're making the assumption, I guess, if, if you say it's, it, it's something that is, is, is something that's programmed in, in by evolution, that it's, it's, it's simply there because of its survival value in a previous stage of, of human existence. It could possibly be that it was put there uh, as part of our, our emergence into, into conscious uh, humanity uh, by a God who wants us to relate to him. So I don't think the evidence goes one way or another on that one, does it? Oh, that was a very good question, and uh, I, I, I have none more to say. <laughs> um, George, where's my... Well, I'll there. Um, it's a chat behind you. <laughs> this is to the proposition. Are there dinosaurs in heaven or hell? <laughs> I'm very old, but I wasn't there. <laughs> Uh, this is to Chaplain Allen. Um, you argue a lot about the power of religion, but can God exist without religion, or can he only express his power through the power of collective human thought and belief? Can God exist without religion, or can he exist only with the power of collective human thought to believe? Can he only exist if hundreds of people if believe, people believe in, him? in him? And are Christians, in your case? Are Christians... In your case, sir, in, as following your arguments. I, why would the collective belief of, of loads of people bring God into existence? Well, because he exists in their minds. God exists in them, but God exists beyond the universe. God is not part of the natural order. 
He's beyond that. And this, I would say, is a fatal mistake that uh, both of the speakers on the other side are making. They're trying to look for evidence for God within the natural world, whereas God is far greater than that. So I would say no to, you, to, to what you're saying. God is not supported in his existence by the human mind in any way at all. If, if, if none of us believed in him, he'd still be there. I'm going to add the point, well, this, this, this being that's beyond the natural universe, you just referred to him as he. You seem to know even his sex. Oh, well, come on, on, come uh, on. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's a shot. That's uh, bizarre. Um, no, there's, there's, you know, the, I, I can't really answer the question because it's, it's off my radar. Um, the belief in God uh, is something that does seem to be an innate part of human, the human psyche. But how it's got there uh, is a matter of evolution. It has evolved because, as the gentleman said up there, it is beneficial to a cohesive uh, society, a group mentality. It helps in some way. But it's not, it's not supernatural. It certainly doesn't help if you're just about to be shot. There have been more martyrs in this, in this century than there have been the whole history of the world, as far as I can tell. But there are more people in this century yes, than there have true. been in the history that's of the world. Quite true. Uh, the chap who's on the floor back there. And I'll do my best to work, work the way around the room, um, so George's legs. Uh, the opposition mentioned um, in the past 200 years we've advanced away from people being persecuted for their sexuality, etc., etc. Um, but how do they respond to uh, the point that the worst atrocities of the 20th century came from uh, secular powers, not things that were done in the name of atheism, but things that were done in the absence of religion and in our own society uh, that's moved increasingly away from Christian values. We have uh, increased amounts of drunkenness, of uh, damaging sexual behavior, things like that, uh, without using examples of contemporary religious immorality to dodge the question. Well, I mean, I would answer that by saying it's very, um, it, what you say is true and sad, and the truth is that we're not always very nice um, animals and we're capable of doing appalling things to one another. And I would say, wouldn't it be nice if we'd been created by a benevolent God who would probably not have made us um, disposed to these kinds of... Um, um, but unfortunately, evolution has given us many propensities to violence, to, um, to hostility to groups of others, and uh, this is something that um, we fortunately have um, the capacity, I think, to overcome if we work on it. But, um. can, can I add something to that? Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to challenge your numeracy. Uh, you have completely conflated um, numbers there. Now, the two hemoclisms of the 20th century were dreadful and awful. But as a percentage of the world population, the wars of religion in the late medieval period were equal or greater in terms of the number of people who died relative to the total world population. Now, what has happened in the 20th century and since the middle of the 19th is there has been a huge reduction in conflicts between great powers. There have been two appalling, <coughs> huge hemoclisms, but the rate at which those affairs occur is declining and has declined very, very significantly. I, I can't let that go without okay. uh, just a comment that when you look at what uh, Mao Zedong has done um, with slaying more than 40 million of his own people. I would um, say 70 million. Yeah, <coughs> and you get um, much the same number, actually ne nearer 70 um, million with, with Stalin and with Hitler, and folk like that uh, all came from an atheistic background. No, they didn't. That's they completely did. wrong. They're every single one of them did. No, they did not. That is completely wrong. I'm afraid you're... Adolf Hitler came from a Catholic background. Stalin was raised by, uh, in a seminary. Uh, Mao Zedong, yes, he had no formal religious belief. Right, let's but come back let's, on that. Let's take may. two out of three then. <laughs> now, no, I can't give you two out of three, much as I would like to. I want to be generous tonight. Um, Hitler <laughs> was 
um, absolute slaughterer of Christians mm. and did so systematically. Um, and Stalin um, <coughs> had, when he was dying, he, he sat up in bed when they thought he'd gone and he shook his fist at, <coughs> at, at the God that he has been against ever since his, um, his great purge. Um, which, which led to the execution of countless people in gulags and elsewhere. Um, just, very quickly. Please. Just very quickly. I mean, I'd just like to know what this is supposed to show. We know yeah. that people are disposed to kill one another under some yeah. circumstances. Some religious, many religious people have killed other people, yeah. usually <laughs> on the basis of religion. Um, other people have found other reasons to kill large numbers of other people. Um, all we can conclude from this is we are not the sort of creatures that would have been made by an all-benevolent God. Uh, uh, question just there. In his own image. Wait for the microphone. Back microphone. <laughs> Thank just you. While the microphone's getting there, could I, could I add one quick one? <laughs> 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 Um, that we could not have been made by a benevolent God yep. if there's, there's nasty stuff in us. Um, the teaching of the Bible is that God did make a perfect world, and he made a world with freedom of choice. You can't have love without freedom of choice. And that man has been exercising that choice um, against him and for selfish instincts, and it's gone right down the generations. And, the as, theologians as call it the fall. being omniscient, he knew they would. <laughs> no, I think that's not fair. Well, are we perhaps <laughs> talk about this. Yeah, the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and which Bible are you referring um, to? I, I agree with um, with Michael, but um, I was just wondering. You, you refer to evil a lot um, as your evidence against God, um, but I was wondering about what scale you you rate evil on, because if there's no God, there's no morality, and there's no good or bad. So how do you kind of go in between those without... How did you make that logical sense? Because there's no, I, there's, no, there's, no absolute, there's no absolute truth, and there's no absolute goodness well, if, you, you, if made, you don't you have God. You just made a, a, a logical fallacy of making the proposition that there is no morality without God. Well, hang on, you've got to sustain that before I'm going to engage with you in the rest of the conversation. Because well, if, I tell if, if, if my... If my, if, if my, if my brain is just made up of something that's it's nothing, why should I believe what you have to say well, anyway? Your brain isn't made up of just nothing. But you, you, that's what you're claiming. No, there's I'm no, not, there's no not, purpose. I never said that. I never said that. <laughs> so you agree or disagree, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, a lady in the green jumper. Um, this question is for the opposition. I think it's for Mr. Denby. Um, one of your <laughs> earlier points was that um, people create the idea of an explainer because they wouldn't have to worry about anything. Um, if that's true, how do you explain the literally countless number of people who have died for their faith? Um, do you believe that they thought having life with nothing to worry about was worth dying for? I think that's actually oh. for John. Oh, okay. um, well, um, I mean, I... Th a lot of them, of course, died because because they happened to end up with people who had a different faith. Um, I guess that that's that's um, one answer. But but look, I mean, if the question is, do people believe very strongly in their religion? The answer is clearly yes, as all those people uh, dying for their faiths show. It's a bit tragic that people are dying for all kinds of incompatible faiths in different places at different times, but it's something people do. So there's no question, I don't think on this side of the table, that people feel very strongly uh, that, that their religions are true. The question is whether they have any reason to believe that, which is a rather distinct question from whether they feel it. Feeling it doesn't make it true. Mm. Mm. Quite um, there's got to be evidence. There is evidence. Yes. Richard. <laughs> Where was God in Auschwitz? Where was God in Auschwitz? God was in Auschwitz. That is a place of utter horror, and the God that I worship went to the place of utter horror in person on Calvary. And there are people who were in Auschwitz. I mean, the most amazing thing that I, I know about Auschwitz was a Russian nun 
uh, who said to a Jewish girl who was terrified, who was going into the gas chambers, Christ is risen, there is nothing to fear, and walked in with her. But his utter, utterable evil it was, utter evil. If you ever want proof of evil, Auschwitz is it. Um, well, um, uh, I, I think this, this idea of, of um, the horror of human sacrifice uh, which uh, Michael refers to this this Calvary. I mean, this is this is just an old story of human sacrifice to placate the gods. Uh, I think that's slightly insulting in in trying to make any comparison with Auschwitz. Um, Auschwitz was a product of a very disturbed mind and a very disturbed society that that mind managed to influence. Um, there have been some pretty nasty people, but not very many of them. Stalin, Hitler, you know, Mao Zedong. Um, those three managed to cause more trouble than, and more horror uh, than most of the rest of the population of the world. Um, that their roots were in religious belief is something that these people are always trying to duck. And I will say again, that the origins of the Jewish persecution by the Nazis come from Catholicism. That's where it comes from. Okay, thank you. I, I think we may be missing the point of, of, of your, your question, uh, which is surely, um, if there is a God, why does he allow things like Auschwitz to happen? Why doesn't he step in and do something about them? And uh, it seems to me that the best answer I can give, most honest answer to that, is I don't know. There are lots of situations in which I would like God to intervene, and he doesn't. Now, I can come up with partial answers about uh, human freedom and sin and uh, all kinds of other things, but ultimately, I don't know the answer to that one. What I will say is this, that this is a world in which there is unmitigated horror sometimes, but we're not all jumping over cliffs to get out of it. Mm -hmm. It's also a world in which there's incredible beauty, <coughs> breathtaking uh, happiness, all kinds of other things. We're in a world of mixed good and evil. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can prove God or disprove him mm -hmm. simply from the evidence in, in, in the world around. Mm -hmm. It has to be more than that. Um, uh, you, we're about halfway through the Q&As, and I, I, I know people have got lots of hands up in this side of the room, but we've got, we can't neglect that side continuously. So we're all around. <laughs> and, uh, ben. This is the proposition. One of the key contentions so far you've made is that atheists are not necessarily immoral, but they're amoral. So my question is this. If God is an infallible moral arbiter, then why do Christians disagree with each other? Why are there different faiths? Why have Christians, Muslims, and Jews fought wars against each other? Why do people not agree? And why can the Church of England, which is, uh, by all accounts, the most amiable religious organization there ever was, why can even they not agree? Um, and so I think this entire idea that God is an infallible moral uh, decision maker uh, is completely wrong. I don't see how you can sustain it. L let me have a go at that, if I may. Um, I think there's a bit of a fallacy there because you're talking about um, a, a, a perfect moral God and very Im imperfect people all squabbling with one another. And um, it's one thing to have a perfect God, but th the followers of him can often have imperfect perceptions of him and um, imperfect actions with one another and are acting inconsistently with how they should respond to a moral source of good. But let's talk, for let's talk about consistency for a moment. If there is no God and if we are just simply the products of, mind, uh, of matter and chance and time, you get this. I just happen to have jotted this down from Dawkins. Um, you won't find any rhyme or reason or any justice in the world. The universe we observe was precisely the properties, has precisely the properties we would expect if there is no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind and pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is and we dance to its music. Now, m most um, humanists are much nicer <laughs> and better than this logical basis mm. from which they stem. Mm. And Dawkins isn't. Um, he is 
ruthless about it. And that quotation I find rather horrific. But to be sure, um, that doesn't justify uh, the disagreements and the wars and the bad things that have been done by people from different religions. Well, I just, I, I hope that, that the, um, the philosophical um, speculations of one atheist are not supposed to, to summarize the views of all atheists and, and uh, the suggestion that um, there is no good or evil in a world that doesn't have um, some arbiter who mm -hmm. on your side of the table you admit um, doesn't actually give you the goods on what actually mm -hmm. you should believe about good or evil um, is not something I certainly want to accept. I think good or evil are um, human constructions, but they're very important human constructions and they can provide very strong grounds for distinguishing what really is good and what really is evil. Uh, personally, I find that statement of Dawkins is rather uplifting. Uh, and uh, I am in no way daunted by it. Uh, it's slightly a selective misquote, because there's more to the passage than he states there. Dawkins is painting the <laughs> pure science view and adds to it that we are the product of that and that we need to understand our nature in a truthful way and then go about being nice to each other because he doesn't suggest that we are going to be horrible to each other as a direct result of that we are just what we are and we need to be understanding that we are what we are uh, well, do you want to take this further? no, no, sorry okay <laughs> <laughs> very happy now let's uh, clap in the glasses Left a bit, George. <laughs> Is there other trapping glasses? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a question to the proposition. Uh, you actually stepped into like the shoes of an atheist and like um, thought about if what well, if we came by chance and you didn't like that because it did seem a bit iffy. First of all, there is actually a huge amount of evidence which shows that we did come here by chance. Yes, it is a tiny figure, it's like ten to the power of like a huge number, but it's still a chance. But even then, I actually quite like how we did come out into, from such like a tiny chance. I mean, it's like even through like the chaotic turmoil of the universe, with no like, you know, caring being at all, we are still alive. And not just being alive, we actually flourished to some, to some extent. So I would just like to hear your thoughts on the matter. I'm afraid my old failed ears couldn't yes. cope with all that. Your thoughts on the matter that we, yeah. we, we came out of that, that there's a chance mm -hmm. we came out of nothing, and that chance is yes. actually never since. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no. Was <coughs> that a question? <laughs> <laughs> what you seem to be saying, if, if I can just answer, what you seem to be saying is, is that um, it gives you courage and, and, and hope that we emerged by chance from nothing and we're doing so well. Yes. How can you take credit for that? <laughs> you're not going to take credit for being created by an all-powerful being. <laughs> We're not into the credit, credit business. No, oh, indeed. Well, you just work. No, I think no. you should take credit for yeah. it and, and enjoy it while you can. I mean, that's, that's the point. Well, in my view, it's like, of like being an atheist. Like being an atheist, it's just like, I don't really mind if there's like a caring being at all. Now, if I die, then I die. I'm just very happy to be alive, in, like, at all. Yeah. Even if there is like no caring being we at must all. Move on. Sorry, uh, chap in the purple, uh, please, please. Thank you. Um, this question is for Mr. Green. In your opening statements, you were talking about a creator and the need for a prime mover in a, a world that's so beautiful and organized. How then do you jump from a position of deism to theism? In other words, what is your evidence for a private God, a personal God that cares for you? Uh, what is my evidence for a, yes, What's your evidence for a personal God? God? For How do you become a theist a from a deist? Well, I wouldn't, I didn't talk about a prime mover, um, but I did, um, because there's all sorts of philosophical problems with that one, as we, we know. But um, I did argue that the, the existence of this world uh, suggests an intelligent mind. 
and um, Darwin thought that. Yes. Uh, all sorts of people have thought that, and I still think it's much the most... Uh, Say it's true. Yeah. How do we then get to a personal God, someone that cares about you? He's just a creator. How, does he, how do you know that he cares about you? I think my hint is this, that um, rivers don't flow higher than their source. And you've got um, personality here. In, we may not be able to define it, but you know the difference between a corpse and a robot and a real-life person. There is such a thing as personality, which has led um, certainly Christian thinkers to say um, the source from which we come has at least personality, though maybe much beyond personality. And that's where the Christian would argue about morality and say this is something that is, um, uh, conscience is in everybody's heart, everybody has some conception of right and wrong, and that indicates that the source from which it comes is concern for right and wrong. So I think it's that sort of inference, but um, with my colleague here and certainly with the, with the other side, uh, you cannot demonstrate the existence of God. You need to look at the evidence and um, produce the best solution that you can. But the personhood of God is most demonstrated in the coming and the dying and rising of Jesus Christ. Um, and the chap, run right at the back, uh, your worship, where they thought. Um, I'd like to ask, seeing as hundreds of millions of people are born in countries, Muslim or Hindu countries, grow up and die without ever having the chance to learn about Jesus, how do you subscribe to a God who condemns these people by his own system to hell and not offering them a way out? Well, I just answered. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're making the assumption there that everybody who's born in a Muslim or Hindu country who has no chance to hear about Jesus automatically goes to hell. I don't think that's necessarily the case of things at all. If God... No, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. What the Bible says is that uh, God condemns nobody who has not made the deliberate decision to turn away from him and live in their own selfishness rather than accepting the forgiveness that's offered in Jesus Christ. Now, if I have never had the chance to hear about that in my lifetime, nonetheless, God is fair, God is love, and God knows how I would have decided if I had the chance. And so I don't think there is any, any indication in the Bible anywhere that people are condemned to hell in the way that Robert Burns writes about, sends eight to heaven and nine to hell for his good pleasure. God doesn't operate like that. Seven times or eight times in scripture it says God is no respecter of persons, mm -hmm. which simply means God doesn't play favourites. Mm -hmm. So I think your assumption is completely wrong. I just said, my, my, when I was, during my Catholic upbringing, yeah. these unfortunates went to limbo, I believe, but yeah. God's probably changed his mind since then. Oh. That was the only bit. And, and hell, hell was abolished by the English courts in the 19th yeah. century. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, they don't have to worry. <laughs> Um, uh, the lady just there. Um, what does the relatively new existence of atheism and humanism say about God's existence in the modern world? I'm sorry, could you say that a bit louder? Um, what does the relatively new existence of atheism and humanism say about God's existence in a modern world? Did you say new existence of atheism and humanism? <coughs> existence well, of... Which is wrong. <laughs> it isn't new. No. I think she but a more religion. secular society, Gross. a more acceptance of the secular society. Yeah. I, I still haven't got the question, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. The, the relevance of, of atheism to God's existence. Yes, if, if you can understand the question, you well, answer it. Well, I, I, just, I guess it gives me an occasion to just, just respond to the opening remarks about all these... Um, <laughs> The, the, these uh, not stupid people who believe in God. And I guess um, one of the things I think we really shouldn't take put much weight on is the argument from authority. I mean, people have believed all kinds of um, mm -hmm. stupid things. So I would say on this side, I don't think atheism, uh, the existence of atheism 
shows that atheism is true or theism is true. Um, the existence of atheism reflects the fact that I, in a world where we're beginning to understand um, how things work by looking, um, the, the, the uh, attraction of appealing to a, a kind of entirely hypothetical quasi-personal entity um, is declining and more and more people are finding that they can live better without this um, hypothesis. So I think it's the, it's the atheism is explained by, um, by the conditions of the modern world rather than the other way around. I just came across a day to go um, a bit in Plato where he says that um, atheism is the disease of the heart before it becomes the disease of the head. <laughs> Work that one out. <laughs> um, the chap in the red jumper. Thank you. My questions to the proposition. You touched upon earlier an intelligently designed purpose. My question is, why are you so sure that things have a purpose, human beings? And if so, what is the purpose of, say, the Japanese tsunami or Hurricane Katrina? I can't begin to answer that question. All I think I would want to say, this is what's helped me a bit with these um, terrible disasters that hit the world. I mean, a lot of evil is because of, of the misuse of human free will. But when you get these natural disasters like that, <coughs> to do with tectonic plates and what have you, um, I cannot uh, give you a satisfactory answer about that. But um, if you were to see a, um, a, a drawing that um, made sense and was an, a nice and beautiful drawing, but in the bottom right-hand corner was a tremendous lot of squiggles and stuff like that. You wouldn't say that this had been made by somebody who hadn't got any intelligence and any skill in design. You would say there is that, but there's also the other stuff which I can't make head or tail of. And I don't think any of us, from whatever philosophical worldview we come from, have been able uh, to give a satisfactory answer to natural evil. But if you can't so make head or tail of it, then why are you so sure that humans have a purpose? Mm -hmm. Did, uh, um, <coughs> the, uh, lady just there. Uh, um, my question is to the opposition. If there is no God, how can you explain miracles? Uh, there are no miracles. <laughs> there is no evidence. How are there people regaining their sight? How are there people regaining their hearing through prayer? How is this happening? Well, it's not through prayer. Well, it is. Uh, it is um, in every case where claims for miracles have been examined by uh, a proper rational scheme, uh, some other explanation. Uh, than the miracle, i.e. a grounded, reasoned explanation, uh, always emerges. There is no sustained evidence that anything miraculous has ever happened. That is absolutely false. Absolutely <laughs> Please, will you quote the evidence then? <laughs> yes, I will. Let, let me let, let take all sorts of evidence. Let me take one. Uh, I've got in my house... Um, a baseball cap, which was given me by a man. This man um, was riddled with cancer, um, and he was an air, uh, an air pilot in Canadian Airlines. He um, was a Christian man, and um, his consultant was also a Christian, and the consultant said, John, you've had it. Um, you're absolutely covered with cancer, that's it. And the guy turned to the wall, and he prayed and said, God, uh, I'm perfectly willing to die, I'm very ready to die. But if you've got anything more for me to do, I'd be happy to have an extension of life. Um, he, was, he was immediately cured. And what's more, he was taken back into Canadian Airlines, I think they're about the only person who ever has been. Now, that's a, a, a trifling example. But when you look but supremely at the life of Jesus Christ, you find that miraculous is um, shot through. That lifestyle. I, th there is, a, there are, people do. I mean, and it's amazing how how people waste public money, but or just maybe private. But there are quite consist, quite a 
good deal of work has been done on experiments of systematically praying for people to see whether they get better from diseases, yeah. where actually there is evidence, you know, in the sense of significant numbers of people, statistical analysis, and the results are consistently and reliably that people don't get any better with lots and lots of people praying for them, even very sincere, deep believers praying for them. Yeah. And people do recover from cancer. Mm -hmm. I do not believe there is a study that shows that Christians recover from cancer more often no, than atheists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm prepared to bet, if anybody is prepared to fund the study, that this will not be the case. You need to remember that the plural of anecdote is not data. Yeah. I, I'm Scottish, so I'm certainly not going to fund that study, but I think all of this... <laughs> <laughs> I think all of this research is completely wrong-headed. Um, the only thing I would disagree in, in, with in what you said is I don't think the results have been consistent. I think some have been promising and some have been completely uh, up, uh, against it. It's been an up-and-down set of results. And naturally so. Why should you expect that the creator of the universe can be made to jump through your hoops? OK, God, we're going to do a little test to see just how powerful you are in answering prayer. Now, we're, go we're going to get so many people praying for such and such, and this control group are not going to be prayed for. Heal this lot, and not this lot, and then we will believe in you. Why should you respond to anything like that? How arrogant can you get? It's a bit like Keith saying at the start, OK, God, let's have a thunderbolt then. Why should he? <laughs> <laughs> Hands up. I don't even shout me down here, but we'll take one last question. I can't see a face, but I can see a hand from the floor. Um, if you stand up and you ask the question, so that has to be the last one. Prove, prove that you're so really there. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was once an example used of where you have a car, and just because you can explain how the engine in it works doesn't remove the need for someone to have designed the engine in the first place. With that kind of idea, is it rational to have an argument entirely based on the scientific and internal workings of it and not have of sorry not it, of the universe and not have any reference or far less reference to philosophy than at least we used to have in atheist versus christian debates maybe a couple of hundred years ago it's moved far more to a scientific background mm -hmm. if that makes sense is, is, that, is that a question about design is that the, yeah, yes. yeah i mean um i i think that this this is the reason why, and actually evolution has been surprisingly absent from this discussion, but this is, this is the reason why um, the uh, theory of evolution has been so significant in this evolving discussion, because arguably prior to the development of the theory of evolution, we didn't have a good explanation for the appearance of design in living things. We do now, and so it seems to me that that's the reason why uh, the appearance of design, of course I say appearance because I don't think living things are designed, is now part of a very deeply worked out and understood and, and investigated explanatory <laughs> system that really enables us to, to say with confidence that the appearance of design is just that appearance. There is no need for a designer to explain the way the way these the, the living things work. <coughs> Are you glad to hear first? I think uh, I, I sympathise with what you're saying because I, I think that it, the mistake that's being made again and again here is that we are assuming that scientific truth is the only kind of mm. truth there is, and if you say that scientific truth is the only kind of truth there is, that is not a scientific statement. Mm. And therefore, it's not true. So, well, I, I like to qualify that truth is the only kind of truth there is. Right, uh, that'll do. And I think how you how you get there is the point. And that's probably exactly. a good place to draw the, the main debate to an end. Um, and I really am sorry for people that have their hands up still, but um, there's about 350 of you in here. I try to get as many as possible. They were very good. Bronze of us. So we move on to summations. Um, no more than two minutes, please. Summation for the opposition. Keith Denbigh, please. Well, on the fact about the evidence. 
Yeah, I, I'm from a scientific background. I want the evidence. And to me, God is just unnecessary. It doesn't, the idea doesn't anymore explain anything. It doesn't add anything to human endeavor. Uh, claims that such uh, uh, an idea is necessary are just wrong. Um, they, they don't understand the nature of science. Science is going to say, I don't understand that. It's not going to say, there must be a God. Science is going to say, I don't understand that. There's a PhD thesis in me for it somewhere. Now, I'm sorry that, that those of you who are committed Christians here, I, I know you are in love. And, and I, I know it's no good criticizing your boyfriend. If you're criti I criticize my daughter's boyfriend, no matter how reasonable and rational my criticisms may be, I, I'm not going to win that argument. Uh, so thank you for putting up with my teasingness. Uh, and I hope those of you who abstained will be listening to the reasoned arguments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Denby, and uh, summing for the proposition, please, uh, Michael Green. Keith, that was charming. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> um, suppose for a moment, with the vast majority of humankind, that God exists. Then imagine what it would be like if you were God. What would you do to get through to men and women who swore black and blue that you didn't exist? Well, you might begin by creating a marvelous world which shouted aloud the skill, power, and beauty of the creator. God has done that. You might create people who were capable of love, people with the dangerous gift of free will, able either to respond to you or to reject you. God has done that. You might then instill into their hearts values which spoke of you, like goodness and creativity and love. These would be your footprints in the sand of their lives. Well, God has done that. You might build in a conscience which would alert them to right and wrong. God has done that too. You could then instill a God-shaped hole in their lives which you alone could satisfy, a space that cried out for fulfillment, however much rubbish they crammed into it. God has done that as well. You might even decide to come in person to their world. You would have to come as one of them, of course, because if you disclosed yourself in all your power and beauty, they would be blinded by the sight. You would need to learn their language so perfectly that you could easily be mistaken for a native. God has done that. And if your love for them was boundless, you might even c contemplate one further step reconciliation. They're out of touch with you, self-centered and alienated, but if you were determined to broker reconciliation, you might even decide to suffer that alienation personally on their behalf and so to woo them back. God has done that too. That's the Christian claim. If it's true, it's the most important thing in the world. So you might care to come in the coming week to the Christian uh, events week and soon to be. I'd like to thank the panel very much for that and thank you for the questions. Um, we now go to our closing vote. There may be no abstentions this time round, so you're either voting with the proposition or with the opposition. Please raise your hands nice and high, especially if you're sitting on the floor, and I'll, I'll start over here. Voting with the proposition, please.
And uh, those voting with the opposition, please. Uh, with that, I can declare that the proposition have won this evening's debate. That only leaves me to award the bottle of wine, and I think we might have made the right decision because it's not yet been turned back to water. Of good questions, but I enjoyed. Uh, it came from over there. I forget who asked it though. If there was a God, why are there no? Uh, if if there is no God, how do miracles not happen? Very good. Sunday email, give you all the details, also for the competition. Um, before we go, uh, Toby Ling, somewhere, wants to make a shout out, so just listen up. Guys, thank you all so much for coming. Um, thank you to the base for hosting this. It's been awesome. um, there is indeed uh, a week of events that the ECU is putting on. It's next week, um, so from Monday to Friday, uh, we're going to have events and talks. If anything tonight has got you thinking, um, there's going to be lots of chances to explore more the God that Michael and John are talking about, the Christian faith and the claims of Jesus. Uh, every lunchtime at one o'clock in the M&D rooms, um, we're going to be exploring some of the objections to Christianity. Uh, it's going to be very relaxed and informal. There'll be some free food, um, and you can come and ask your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you're Sorry, looking at, I've, I've got well. a plug. Can I can I have my quid pro quo <laughs> quid pro quo plug? Um, there is a nascent atheist humanist secular society at the university, and they're looking for people to uh, show an interest. Um, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy and Robert here will, will be with me up, upstairs uh, at the top there after this debate, and you can come along and see us uh, and put your name down for that society. They're trying to form it. They need your support. Uh, and please uh, come along if, if we've said anything that interests you. Thank you. Uh, guys, and if you're sitting here tonight and you're thinking you like this kind of Friday night thing, coming along to a debate, um, please come and chat to us. We're going to the pub now in true Debstock fashion. Come and talk to us. And um, if you want to join, you can still join up today. Thank you very much. Guys! <laughs>
um, or one of the committees. Jo ask Johnny, ask Tiny Sue. I'm here with Michael Green. Michael, how do you think the debate went? Well, I think it was a, a very warm and friendly, very courteous debate, some very sharp and excellent questions, and uh, the other side, at any rate, gave some excellent answers. <laughs> we stumbled along and uh, did our bit. So, so building on that, how do, you, how do you feel about the opposition's points? 
I thought um, many of them were actually not very consistent. Um, he, uh, my proponent started off with a god being really dreamed up, rather like the spaghetti monster. The difficulty with that is that I've never met any adult people who have been converted to belief in the spaghetti monster. But I have met hundreds of thousands of people in the course of my rather long life who, as adults, coming from an atheist position, have become committed Christians. So, the, you know, that sort of parallel is, is, is a good joke, but it's, 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 it's not much fun. And there's quite a lot of that sort of level. Some, some excellently um, uh, things were said to show that um, so many humanists um, are uh, much more humane than coming out of plankton soup would suggest. And um, that just shows that human beings are often better than their theories, and sometimes worse either, as well, as many of us are. You know, they pointed out that Christians do not live up to their standards all the time, and um, that brings the whole cause into disrepute. Anyway, let's talk about something else. Okay, if I could very concisely yeah. ask you to very concisely take one strand from your argument that you'd put forward as proof of the existence of God, what would it be? The biggest proof is the person of Jesus Christ, who has fascinated humankind for the last 2,000 years, has dominated art and music and um, uh, healing, um, and has transformed the lives of multi-millions. If you want to know about uh, the truth of Christianity, that's the place to start. Start reading a gospel with an open mind, saying, what do I make of this stuff? The total new literary form was thrown up by this guy coming. What do we make of it? Um, just a little personal question I'd kind of yeah, like sure, to ask sure. you. Um, how do you feel about the existence of sort of other creative figures, uh, Allah, Vishnu, or even going back yeah. to Zeus, the classical yes. mythology? Yeah. Well, I mean, I am a classicist, and so that's really my sort of thing. But all of these were recognising a... Um, a, a force greater than themselves. A lot of it was crude. When, when there was thunder, they thought the gods were fighting and that sort of thing. But they believed in the existence of a supreme deity. Monotheism um, was there from the start. It didn't, didn't evolve into monotheism. It was there for a very long time. And um, I think we're bound to be agnostic about the nature of God unless he has shown his hand. And um, the evidence is... I believe that he has shown his hand um, supremely in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, in, in the last century, it's quite interesting, the word agnostic it didn't exist until Spencer and um, Huxley said, you cannot know about God, you cannot find out what, about him. True enough, seems unanswerable, but that doesn't stop the possibility of his revealing himself to us. And that's the Christian claim that's worth investigating. Well, thank you ever so much for that. Very, very interesting news. I'm now going to pass over to Lorna, who will be talking to a member of the opposition. Um, hello, so I'm here with um, Keith Denby, um, who was the opposition. Um, so how did you think tonight went? Um, well, I had a lot of fun, and uh, it was quite clear that, you know, if you're going to have a, a debate uh, with a large number of Christians in the audience, you're going to have to struggle to win an argument uh, which says there is no God, uh, but it's entertaining while you do it. Is, um is some, like disproving, is that something that you aim to do? Do, do you want to convert people away from Christianity? Uh, I never ever do that. Um, I'm here for uh, the entertainment of the uh, debating society. Um, only when I'm asked do I uh, let forth uh, in this kind of way. Um, and I never proselytise at all unless I'm invited to something like this. Absolutely. One thing you did um, open your argument with was a statement that said um, uh, science flies people into the space, uh, whereas religion um, flies people into buildings. Um, you were mentioning about having a sense of respect towards certain groups, Christianity perhaps not having that. Um, do you think this was perhaps an appropriate or respectful thing to say in a room of believers? Uh, it's a teasing and, um, and um, uh, slightly acerbic thing to say, but, you know, I'm like that. That's the way I am. Fair enough. Uh, it wasn't original. It's not an original statement. It's stolen from, you know, a, a banner I saw on the um, protest the Pope march. 
No, okay. And um, one thing, one question I did have was um, about uh, if we lived in a perfect world, uh, if, sorry, if God existed, we'd live in a perfect world. Um, but a lot of people do turn to faith uh, during times of natural disaster and things like that. Why do you think that is? Because uh, it helps them. Uh, it, it is a huge help. Uh, it may not be based on any real uh, evidence or any reality, but it's a, it's a, it's a psychological support. Uh, it's well recognised. Um, you can't deny that that occurs, um, but it's not actually based on there being any God. It's a psychological coping mechanism that we have evolved. So this psychological coping method could give people uh, a feeling of more purpose to their lives. Uh, you as a non-believer, do you feel you lack purpose in your life? Oh, the very opposite, no. Um, I'm, I'm hugely um, um, motivated by the wonder that I see around me and the curiosity to find out how it all happens, how it all works together, and what I can do to help other people and, and uh, particularly young people uh, to come to an understanding of how to be good in this rational world. And the benefits of, of a rational approach uh, rather than a, um, a supernatural approach, uh, as what I was talking about. Some of the serious points I made is that actually the world has got hugely better since we stopped believing in the supernatural and started working with reason. Can you think of an example of this? Uh, well, yes. Um, uh, the National Health Service. Um, modern medicine, uh, modern social care, uh, and as I did quote, the, the actual rate of reduction uh, in, in major world war incidents is clear example uh, of a better cooperation that comes through rationally looking at other people and say, saying to yourself, well, how would you feel in that situation? Well, thank you very much for your time tonight. Um, it's been a very heated debate tonight, um, one that I'm sure many of us have enjoyed. So thank you very much for watching with XTV and uh, we hope that you'll tune in again sometime soon. Thank you for watching.